So um, most of us have been living the dream, staring at graphs looking like this for the better part of the last 15 years. And uh, one of the problems with systems metrics as presented by RRD is that um, they're kind of, um, it's taking up an awful lot of screen real estate to not tell you very much. Um, this is you know, a scalar number, eight servers in this cluster. Uh, but um, the, you know, there's, there's all this um, you know, logic to work out averages and transitions over time. Um, one of the things that goes into the core of the way that RRD was designed was that once upon a time, disk space was expensive, or at least a very limited resource. And so we couldn't just record all the system data ever and keep it around forever because we'd, we'd exhaust our disks. So what was built into the system was uh, something that would compact over time, that you would uh, set a policy and it would retain data at a high resolution for an hour, and then it would average it down and compact it so that it would then maintain a, a five minute type average for a week, and then compact it again down to month and year and so on. Uh, with the result that you had a constant size database. You could, the moment you initialize the database, know exactly how big that file on disk would ever be, and thus manage resource saline. This was a good thing for sysadmins once upon a time. Um, the trouble is that um, it's a little on the lossy side. Uh, we had uh, an event where apparently we had 7.8 servers in the cluster. Um, and, and that's obviously a result of averaging and smoothing, right? Um, and it's a side effect of, uh, of this, this kind of storage mechanism. Uh, the, so the question is, can we do something about that? Uh, I would like to build a system that, doesn't, that keeps the data, because the, the, the challenge that we have is if we want to do analytics of any form on data in the present age using proper mathematical, mathematical models, you need to give those models all the points. You can't pre-smooth them, you can't average them, you need to give the raw data to the people doing the math. Because it's an analytics decision whether or not to throw away data, and it shouldn't be one in the storage system. Um, so we need to store uh, all the data at, raw re at, at source resolution. We want to give uh, that data uh, in its original form, not derivatives. This is something that um, is kind of clued into the system and community a few years back. Jamie Wilkinson speaks very eloquently about this. Um, but uh, we, we don't want to calculate rates. It's very tempting to store first derivatives in your systems database, but uh, you end up doing it wrong, basically. Uh, whose idea of time are you using? What, you know, how many points went into a system? If you're talking about events and you're downsampling that to once per second or something like that, you're throwing away huge amounts of data, potentially. Um, especially when we're looking for anomalies and it's the little transitions that are actually end up being really significant. So we want to store raw data points, not first derivatives. And the biggest thing of all is that I don't want to worry about disk space. On the one hand, no, it's not RRD land anymore, um, and all hail to Toby, but you know, we, we, we can expand, except that at, you, we now deal with problems like customers with 100 gigabyte MySQL databases in a single table and wondering why things don't work, or 27 terabyte in NFS systems, but we won't talk about that. Um, the, the thing is, is that I want a system where I don't have to worry about whether the file system is getting too big or how am I going to grow this MySQL database or Postgres database. I'd like something that would just scale horizontally without me needing to worry about. Um, and, you know, it would be nice if it was fault tolerant. Uh, you know, I mean, maybe I'm asking for too much here. But. So I turned to Ceph. Uh, at Anchor, we had a Ceph cluster. Uh, we've been hearing about Ceph for some years, from, among others, from Sage uh, here at the conference. And uh, just even before I joined the firm, um, they had already set up a, an experimental Ceph cluster. I'm like, hey, this is terrific. Um, I, I'm pretty enthusiastic about Ceph. It's good to see that you guys are too. Let's use it. Uh, the, um, those of you, well, many of you would be familiar with Ceph, but some, some aren't. Um, if you have worked with or, even, or just learned about Ceph, chances are you've worked with one of these three things. Uh, Rados GW, which is a S3 or Swift compatible uh, front end because you have HTTP access to objects. Um, the, where, the, where the place where Ceph really got traction was RBD, a block device that's backed onto, uh, onto Ceph. And this powers virtual machines in quite a number of organizations. Uh, and it's, it's uh, fantastic because it means that the, virtual, the, the, block, the block images behind a VM don't have to be co-located as local storage with machine. So it means that the whole problem of local storage and worrying about how to get that local storage to another machine when you're trying to do a migration is just evaporates because it's all effectively network back storage, um, which gives pretty good management uh, efficiencies. That's actually all secondary to the real point that Ceph was created, which was that the original goal was to create a better clustered file system. And it's called CephFS. And 
really all the work that has been done in the last decade since they first started was trying to put in place a really solid, reliable object store to be the backing store behind this file system. And that will come up again a bit later. Uh, what most people don't tend to see is that all of this is built on top of a library called Librados. And this is the client code that talks across the network to the storage cluster to get things to happen. And um, for a while now, we've been wondering, you know, can you actually program against Librados directly? Uh, it was sort of suggested by people talking on behalf of, of the Ceph project that, yes, you can use the API directly, but what, what did that actually involve? Was that practical, or was that just sort of a nice idea that wouldn't really ever come, ever come to anything? Rados is this. It's a reliable, economic, distributed object store, which is um, one of those names that at first glance looks really ugly. It turns out to mean something, but in the end, you don't care because an object is its own best description. So here's the picture that has been seen ad nauseum in, in Ceph talks. Um, but again, just for anybody who doesn't know what an object store is, you've got lots of machines, a few machines that are designated as monitors to enforce quorum, and otherwise, just a large number of machines, each of which have spinning disks. Um, one of the things that's a little different about an object store in this model is that every single disk spinning disk has a process in front of it called an object storage daemon, um, and that they work independently. So the fact that two OSDs might be in the same chassis is kind of irrelevant. They, they don't have anything to do with each other. Uh, they're individual processes. So you manage, you don't build RAID arrays on machines, you just manage individual disks, uh, which was a bit unusual after all those years we spent building RAID arrays. Uh, the, um, this isn't meant to be a talk about, about but Ceph, but I just want to describe one more thing about it, which is that it has a very uh, elegant placement algorithm, which works out that you specify as a policy where things go. Uh, the point is to articulate the failure domains. So if you have data that needs to be stored, uh, you want it to be, uh, let's say you have a data center where you've got rows, and the rows are um, quite expensive to do interconnect between, very limited bandwidth between the rows. But between inside the rows, inter interact, you've got good connectivity, uh, and you want to have a setup where, let's say, the power domains are um, that you expect that maybe you'd lose power to one rack but not another. I mean, that's you know, not necessarily the way your data center would be, but it's a possible failure to set up. And so you would articulate a crush rule, which says that I want to pick from any one row, so pick a row, and then find me three racks with one server per rack and one disk in each of those servers. And that way you've got, if you want three copies of the data, and that way you've got that data spread across uh, different failure domains. And this is the kind of thing that Crush is really good at. Now, that kind of tree layout isn't terribly exciting, but the really um, novel part, and I think the part that made Ceph something that we all set up and take, took note of, was that this calculation is done by clients. The bottleneck that was emerging circa 2005 wasn't the ability to uh, have object daemons and wasn't the ability to put lots and lots of things on them. It was to locate where an object lives. What, de what machine do I talk to? What disk do I talk to to get to a piece of, piece of data? And uh, the, you know, the original solution to that was, well, you'd have some index servers that would uh, know where all the objects are. Well, that become, became a huge bottleneck. It's somewhere between 500 terabytes and a petabyte. And everybody was just crumbling as they tried to scale past that point. Um, Ceph's solution to this is, to, is a, a, a pseudo-random number generator. And you feed this, the, 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 the policy map into it, and it comes out with 742 and 129. And the thing is, is that you, the client, can make that calculation as can all the servers. So when 42 dies, they just crank the calculation and discover that 791 is the fourth one in that set. And they uh, now know where the third copy should be. And the thing is, it's not just the clients that know that. All the individual demons know this too. So the moment that the cluster state changes, every participant in the cluster can think about, oh, wait a minute, I've got objects. I'm the, the, the tertiary for this, uh, for this particular object. I now need to make sure that that one over there knows that it's now responsible for the being a tertiary copy because I'm now effectively the, the secondary. Um, and uh, the former sec the secondary was gone and the former primary, you know, so they, they work as a, in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion to work out to restore the level of redundancy. And balanced over a large cluster, this has, you know, some pretty nice properties. So that's, that's our Rados cluster. So the premise is pretty basic. We gather metrics, we put them in Ceph, and then later on, people pull them out, they do analytics and do work, and then we get pretty graphs, right? Um, good theory. Uh, the, the real question is actually um, that I would turn to is, was the, the final point that I, I mentioned, which was how do you build a fault-tolerant system? Well, well fault-tolerant and distributed are pretty much synonyms at this point. How do you build a, a distributed system that's fault-tolerant that, that can handle something like this? 
And it turns out that there are two properties of our data that make it a little different than a traditional database. Because I know there's some, there are some database developers in the room, and some of them are rolling their eyes already going, what are you talking about building another database? Like, ours there's not even a shortage of time series databases. Um, I think we have a couple insights to offer. One is that if you choose, you can treat your data points as immutable. Now, we're talking about system, primarily the data we're gathering here is systems metrics. You gather the data point, and that's it. It's never going to change. It has identity, like about where it came from. It has a timestamp associated with it usually, and a value, and that's it. And there will never ever be an update on that data point, which was a pretty big uh, insight because almost every database structure out there is concerned with updates and dealing with updating indexes and all the, the, the side effects that happen when you have to make changes like that. Um, we found ourselves with a data set that is immutable. Um, that has, it correlates very nicely with another property, which is that if you want to build a system that is tolerant against failure, it really helps if your operations can be idempotent. Because um, that gives you the ability uh, to not have your credit card be charged three times. Right? I mean, this is the, the core problem of the web, is do not click this button twice. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it's just, it's kind of like the only thing you need to worry about, because if you get that right, pretty much everything else falls out of it. Um, in, uh, in our case, the, the question was, well, I would like a system where I can have multiple, you know, you want a system where you, at least one copy is written. Can you articulate a design where it doesn't matter if more than one copy is written? Um, the way that we did that uh, was, uh, and, oh, the final thing is to not carry any state in the system. Um, because after all, there is no state except that which we make. And that leads me to Voltaire, which is the system we've been building. Um, the properties, um, the, <laughs> the, the, um, the, 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 way, the way it's designed is that we have data points being collected that the, uh, I'm not trying to enforce a universal idea of time. The time is whatever time we get sent in. It's just a timestamp. Uh, the identity is also assigned by wherever the data is coming from. Voltaire itself doesn't care. It just namespaces it and hashes it and sends it on its way. I'll show you a bit more about that in a moment. Um, the item potency property, this was actually, I thought, you know, very clever. And so, of course, always, you know, I've learned enough of now to, to be you know, wary that whenever I have a clever, it's probably going to have consequences. But nevertheless, it was a good idea at the time and, and remains to be seen whether it still is in the long haul. But the clever idea was, Rather than trying to work out that I have a point written, a, a duplicate on write, work it out on read. When you read a whole bunch of points, you're going to pull them into some kind of an or, a hash map or an, or, you know, an ordered, uh, ordered list. If you've got an ordering property and timestamps are a pretty good one, um, then it doesn't matter if I read the same point five times as I'm scanning down uh, a block of data. I can just sort that into, uh, to deduplicate by putting it into a, ma into a set, or a map in this case. And um, the uh, and while you're at it, if it's a sorted set backing a sorted you know backing a map, well then you get your ordering property because sooner or later the system's going to need to order the data anyway. Um, but on the way in, I don't need to have it ordered. So suddenly I've got, I've got two things here. One is it doesn't matter what order points show up in, and it doesn't matter whether I write them twice. So um, that was the original design, you know, and I. I Apologize, it's blurry, but you know it's sort of like fun to look back. Oh, it'll be simple. We'll just have points, and there'll be things saying there'll be some kind of a bus, and uh, we'll have multiple ingestion demons absorbing stuff, and then writing down to Ceph, which will end up in buckets, and then things will come out of the other side. You know that took an afternoon to write, and again, very pleased with ourselves. Um, and that's what it looks like in production. Um, it's um, a lot of pieces. Every single one of those boxes is a different server. Um, and which sort of brings me to the point that this isn't a small system that you can go install on your laptop tomorrow. And I actually feel kind of bad about that, but it's a large system that has the properties that we're after. The point that I'm talking about in terms of item potency and um, immutability, immutability is, is a characteristic of the clients generating the data. Um, the item potency property comes in because the writer demons, uh, labeled in, in, in ingestion here, um, they just take stuff that comes in whenever it comes in. If there's a connection loss, if a writer daemon fails, if there's a network dropout, if the brokers collapse, um, the clients retransmit. I mean, this is you know, inevitably everything in distributed systems comes down to retransmit time. And you, know, you can be a really long time out. Ten minutes later, you can do a retransmit. It doesn't matter. Um, and you get patterns like, well, what happens if a point was written down but the acknowledgment was lost, right? The two generals problem. Well, in our system, we can get around that because we don't care if it's written twice. 
and or eight times, or <clears throat> many more than that when I had real bugs. Um, so, because I mean, you can imagine that things go really wrong here. Like, and I'll just sort of put a little teaser out there. Let's say that your timeout somewhere in the middle of the system is maybe 60 seconds. Well, surely points will get written down in a couple seconds if you acknowledge back, right? And in testing, that's exactly what it looked like. Think about that for a minute. The other thing we did is uh, early on, and I thought this was clever too, and was utterly wrong about, was that we used protobufs, uh, both to encode on the transport and to the serialization format down to the wire. Um, protobufs are a nice way to articulate data. They give you a slight scheme on top of what's other in a binary encoding. Um, they, uh, if you've read, if you work at a place like Google where everything is encoded in protobufs, that's lovely. Um, it's I, anecdotally, it's used as the interface format for virtually everything there. It is sometimes used as a storage format. Um, I was uh, hoping that this would be uh, a good way to make have different clients and different consumers. Be agnostic about, you know, I was working in a language that shall be not named yet, um, but I didn't want any other people to have to worry about that. And so protobuf seemed like a good way to create that abstraction. The trouble comes that um, a whole bunch of these fields are variable length. And it's surprising how expensive that becomes. Uh, and all the, um, and there's two things going on here. In the original design, uh, if anybody has used collect D, for example, um, you'll know that every single data point gets sent along with host slash CPU slash CPU zero and then a value. You get labels like that. Um, and this can be generalized to field value pairs. Uh, it could be the data center it came out of and uh, maybe something about the customer ID, anything like that. But you end up with these key value pairs which identify a source. Um, and although this was all very tight, we were even worrying about you know, how many bytes you should be using for numerics versus sort of more general types. Um, and and the, um, the general um, encoding in protobus for, for integers is variable length, and it uses like um, this many bits to say whether or not it's longer, and then this many bytes, bits of storage, and it, and it rolls along. So um, a, a small integer can be encoded in three bytes, whereas a larger 64-bit um, uh, integer will end up taking seven. Right. And so the sweet spot is, you know, the point is that if it's, you know, since you tend to ship around small numbers, there's no reason to pay four bytes every single bloody time you want to, or eight bytes for a, for a word size, to every time you want to encode the number 12. Right? Um, and so on average, that work, that pays off pretty well in terms of over the wire efficiency. The trouble is, is that frankly, at this, day, at this point, the size over the wire isn't the problem. So I spent all sorts of time worrying about getting the variable encoding right and implementing all this to optimize for something that really isn't it's certainly currently, and maybe this will change again in a little while, but in a data center on a LAN between machines, um, you know, over the wire bandwidth is not the bottleneck. Um, the, other, the other thing you see here is that these field, you know, in order to articulate what is just a map of key value pairs, you, you know, it's fairly easily constructed, you can see that, but um, you're of course going to have to serialize this in and out. So what we were doing was, and this is the part that I thought was um, Get, would allow me to get away with creating a database without having to pay the ten, you know, decade or two of, of building a full database management system, was that um, the whole idea was to punt everything to Ceph. Um, I said that, that there was no state. The, all the pieces in the system other than, I should go back to this, this slide, everything in that system other than in Ceph carries no state at all. There's no state in the brokers. There's the only state in the clients is whether or not a point has been acknowledged or not. So they maintain points that are in flight. But everything else, it, it gets down to Ceph, and that's it. And so um, we encoded the location of points deterministically. Um, there's a generation tag, and then the FM2XR7 part with the namespace, an origin. It was just a digit hash of, of what turned, you know, something like data center or an IP address of the collector or something. It was just, just a namespace. And then, um, a hash of the source. And so what I did there was um, serialize out that, that map. So all the key value pairs, which uniquely identify this host name, you know, host name 71, CPU slash CPU zero. And you just put that you know, into a hash function and come out with that. And that is the deterministic address. And again, and that's sort of the, the, the final driver of this was determinism. The whole thing can be calculated. You don't, I don't need to maintain a whole index of what the address addresses were because uh, every participant in the system could figure it out. So, and then finally, uh, a timestamp to the nearest metric day. I made that up, 100,000 seconds, you know, why not? Um, 
And, and that just seemed as a reasonable system. I mean, trying to do, like, work out what day it is was silly. Just, you know, rounding it to the nearest 100,000 was easy. And that gave me names to then pass to Ceph. And the crush hash function and, and the placement group al algorithms would then work out where it goes. And into the system it is, it, it goes, and it's reliable, it's duplicated um, and mirrored. And that's it. Uh, so that gave us a system whereby we could write arbitrary amounts of data um, to, to Ceph and pull it out again. Um, the writers didn't need to coordinate with the readers. Um, and I mentioned before the business about all that business about deduplication and not having to worry about it. The, the magic that made that work is append. You get item potency if, you, if you're append safe. And there's an append operation in Libretos. And so once we work out the name of the bucket where it goes, we just take the data point, serialize it to bytes, and append. And if you append the same thing six times out of order, it doesn't matter because we sort out ordering and deduplication on read. That was a good design. Um, it had some problems. The, um, we burned a few things to the ground. The first thing we burned to the ground was the Ceph cluster. And the second thing we burned to the ground were the servers writing to it. Um, Ceph makes a few promises. Uh, or not promises, it just, you ask, you know, Sage would, would get up in front of us and tell us that you can have an unlimited number of objects. And that is you know, more or less the case. I mean, unlimited is a big number, but uh, you can have the, the number of the, na the namespace of objects isn't the limit. Um, so the scheme we had where we would have, you know, all these different objects labeled by, uh, name, you know, by namespace and, and hash address, and then over time, piling that up wasn't a problem. The size of objects, they also tell us that that's unlimited. And, well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, they really probably should roll that back because there's this, the trouble is, is that um, uh, RB, both uh, Redis GW and RBD stripe their data over four megabyte chunks. Um, so when you write an object through Redis GW, it actually breaks it up and over whatever hash scheme and then, and then writes them down in, in order. Um, same thing with the block device, it's, it's, they're four meg blocks, and that makes perfect sense. Uh, it might as well be some size and pick one. The trouble is, is that down in the guts of Ceph object daemons, they eventually end up being single-threaded. Um, the concurrency in the system comes from its sheer mass, it's, it's, it's lazy parallelism. Um, there are a lot of places within the system that it's nothing of the sort, and, um, which is fair enough. The trouble is, is that when, a, when, a, when an OSD is responding to a request, it's kind of busy doing that and only that. And so there are, there are cases, and it's, it's not so much server requests as it is doing replication, that there, there are certain operations. And to be honest, every time we thought we'd pin this one down, we kind of figured that we were half right and then found it. So getting an authoritative answer on any of this is actually a little bit tough. But our impression is, is that there are operations that happen one at a time. And so if you go and dump a... Uh, 200 gigabyte object into a Ceph object, uh, 200 gigabyte file into, into Ceph in a single object. It'll take it because you know it's it's you know it, it doesn't it'll absorb that right as long as there's disk space out there. Um, but when it comes time to replicate that object or read it back, things will kind of grind to a halt while it's serving that request and only that request. Um, and so it turns out to be a really good like the, the, the we the experiments we did and this was. Um, uh, up to the point where we became network bound, but we found that the sweet spot was between about 400k and 20 megs. Um, the, the, the bottom of the curve was indeed at 4 megs. So it, it's not a hard-coded limitation, but it certainly is in the DNA of the Ceph code that 4 megs is a good size for objects. So if you're writing something, use that size. Um, and then, of course, the final thing is, and nobody actually promised this, but I, I sort of made an assumption, which was pretty stupid, um, and that was that I could just sort of blast out Asynchronous, there's asynchronous operations, and you fire it out, and they're in flight, and eventually you get an acknowledgement back via a completion mechanism. Uh, it's a you know, primitive, low-level sure futures thing. And that seemed all very coherent, and we read through the code, and it all seemed pretty sound, and it's not that complicated. It's just a straight, it's, it's actually the synchronous mechanism uses the async mechanism under the hood. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's fine, and well, uh, no. And it turns out this makes sense. Um, because when you've got uh, a block device, let's say, on top of Ceph, and you, you write to an object over here, a block over here, you dirty a block and it gets flushed. And so this one lights up and its two friends get, you know, have to synchronize, fine. And then, you know, standard operating system patterns, you're over here and then you write to another block and it, it get, it, that OSD takes the write, it talks to its two peers, if you're replication level three, and uh, they get back and they get back to you. That's fine, this is sort of happening in random, stochastically over the cluster, no problem. 
The trouble, and if you've got a large read, suddenly you know, across a logical contiguous array, then you, know, you might light up 12 of them at once. But again, across a large cluster with hundreds of OSDs, this isn't a problem. The trouble was is that um, we uh, were fine with the number of objects, about a quarter million when we started out. Uh, that represents a quarter million data points we were taking in per, per, per check cycle. Um, and um, there, our sizes were fine. Uh, as, like I said, sometimes we overdid it. Um, but in general, most of our points weren't even triggering, you know, getting past a couple hundred K uh, in, in data. We, we had allowed for some, some larger, higher rate ones uh, and that would have had us around four megs. Um, and so the trouble was is that we, we found that it was taking, um, you know, upwards of, you know, well, this is, there's large error bars on this, but three and a half to five minutes per write cycle to get those quarter million points out. Uh, that translates to about 2,500 operations per second. Um, it's, it's ops per second that is the limitation in a Ceph cluster. Not object size, um, not number of objects, but the rate at which you can manipulate them. And um, it would appear the scales linearly with the number of OSDs. We don't have hard numbers on that. We're kind of busy, you know, desperately trying to sort this out. It would be an interesting experiment to do. Um, but um, it's one of those things. It doesn't show up in development. It's all working great. But when we were launching this many um, points at it, it would take three and a half minutes to complete. Now, there were two problems. I mentioned before about timeouts. Well, guess what happens when you've got 60 second timeouts on the clients that are um, you know, waiting for that acknowledgement packet to come back. They're like, oh, you must have lost my right. I'll send it to you again. So we got up into the, the tens and even maybe close to hundreds of millions of rights pending. Um, and it drained once we figured that out and stopped, you know, stopped resending everything. We were able to drain it in the, better, in the course of a day. Um, Ceph absorbed it. We ended up with some pretty large buckets. Um, but um, we were able to, to deal with it. The thing was, though, is this was absolutely maxing out the cluster because I was sort of you know, waving my hands around saying, couple here, couple here. We were writing to all the, the OSDs simultaneously. And the reality is, is that no matter how distributed a system is, once, when you want to achieve concurrence, uh, consistency, sooner or later, you have to linearize. It's a basic, system, basic property of distributed systems. And so underneath the hood, sooner or later, one OSD is going to need to talk to another OSD to establish that it's got its copy of the object it's trying to get, do a write on and get acknowledgement of, and that other OSD is busy. And so you wait. And so the whole thing just kind of ground to a halt and, and averaged out at the um, pace of, of around about 2,500 ops per second. And it was a, you know, not a small cluster, by the way. It was on the order of seven machines with on the order of 60 or 80 disks in it at the time. So, you know, not huge, but not small. Um, but the, the point was not to maximize the cluster. I mean, this was, uh, this is an internal system. This is overhead. I can't have this um, system you know, wrecking an entire production object store. Um, I need that storage for other things. Uh, we had a couple of VMs back onto it as well with RBD, and needless to say, I was doing very bad things to the performance of those, uh, those VMs. Um, so that had to stop. The other thing was happening, um, oh dear, I'm, uh, so that's V1, I copy and paste here. Um, so yes, I was saying we had 2,500 operations a second. The other problem was the machine writing. We had to get a really big one. And we, were, we had a 16 core machine with 32 gigs of RAM in it and we were flattening it. I mean, I've never seen that many bars in HTOP over to the side cranked up. I've never seen 1,600% CPU usage either. And um, it was regularly running out of memory. Like this thing was ooming and like then filling swap and then ooming and then gone. And which of course was another reason I was losing you know, all these writes in flight. There was a write cycle, I would lose a whole cycle because it was just, you know. And what was going on? It was, um, it turns out that, um, so we were working in Haskell, we are working in Haskell, and we were using the, the standard libraries map. Anybody who's worked in, um, uh, uh, you know, one of the languages that was where our roots are, mutable language like, like C, we're used to tree structures being mutable. And, and tree-based tree map structures are fantastically easy, you know, easy to implement or clean to implement when you can manipulate and change pointers. Haskell is a language which uses immutable data. Um, when you create, when you make a change to an object, it creates a new one. It's a copy and write thing. And um, that has certain properties. And, and uh, you can create this, by the way, in Java. I mean, I, I've built persistent, it's called a persistent structure. When you have a previous version and the next version of a, stru of a data structure, having created a, made a change, you've got both. Um, now, that you'd think that that would be wasteful of, of memory. It's not because you can uh, amortize space over time is you're only changing the nodes up to the root 
um, that are the structure that's changed, which means it's actually quite cheap to store both trees. And the reason that's worth doing is that when you've got a concurrent system and lots and lots of threads, it means that any given thread can always have a consistent, correct, not in progress version of that tree to work with, or data structure in general, which is fantastic, which means that the, all the problems you have about uh, having to lock data structures in a traditional uh, mutable program just go away. I have a copy of the tree, you have a copy of the tree, and like, I can, we can both iterate over them and, and no problem. Um, which is amazing and gives you, you know, if you build a system that you don't, the only point you have to synchronize is the handover of the tree root between, between threads. So you, it's, it's a phenomenal thread safety advantage and it's just sort of a given in the functional programming world. The problem is, is that, remember those uh, field value pairs that were a map that identified a source? Well, a, each value was on the order of 150 bytes uh, which 100, about 100 of which, 120 of which was the, this map. And so I was bringing in those key value pairs, building a, a map of that in order to, which was, by the way, serialized on disk in the protobuf, bring it up into memory into a map in order to order it, serializing it out again in alpha order, just because I had to make sure, to then hash encode it to then trim it down to become that address that was the label. All very deterministic, sure. But I was building up these maps and then throwing them away. In fact, I was you know, taking something serialized, building it up, and then serializing it out again, which was just you know, kind of silly in hindsight. Um, but it wasn't the effort of, doing, of building, building those structures that was the problem, it was the garbage collection. We were generating tons and tons of garbage, and it was, took a, we actually had to do quite a bit of performance tuning, and hooray for perf top. But I, I was worried, because it, was, it was, seemed to be correlated with the right cycle, I'm like, what's going on? And I was really worried that the crush map calculation was, was what was burning me to the ground. Crush wasn't even taking 1% of the CPU, as advertised. It was all the GC. So um, it, there were a couple ways we could have worked around that. It turns out there are mutable data structures in Haskell. Haskell allows you to easily drop into a mutable state. You just need to isolate it so that you can maintain the properties of the language elsewhere. And uh, we could have fixed it that way. We could have tuned the garbage collector. But that really wasn't the way ahead. Um, so, uh, yes. Um, so it's, um, but the two things. So one was it, like this, the, the protobuf structure itself is fine, but you're going to have to bring it into your language to do something with it. And virtually any language in the modern age is going to require you to do, you know, to convert it out of its native format. Um, the, the, the guys who have made something called Cap'n Proto, uh, which is floating around, um, is actually very clever. They've created a serialization format which doesn't have the variable length thing going on and is laid out in memory exactly like a structure. Now, how you actually get structure alignment to line up with a machine you have, I think that's a pretty big assumption. But nevertheless, the basic idea is good. If, you can, if you're a C programmer and you get a structure off the wire that you can just drop into memory and then access as a structure, that's pretty clever because there's no manipulation required. In a higher level language, Python, Perl, on up, um, you're going to need to turn it into that language's terms, which means taking the original source serialized structure and then reformatting it in internal terms. And that will, rec that will create all this, 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 this fluff. Um, so there's really no avoiding that. And that's what makes what was a cool idea not such a good idea. OK. So what are we going to do about it? Um, the changes we made were, first of all, deterministic addresses, or like predetermined addresses, excuse me. You can do a deterministic calculation to get an address. But I was just like, you know, Word64 is pretty big. We will give you an address. Um, and either you can ask the system for the next one. We had an auto increment in there. So if you want to guarantee next clean address or just an unused address, we had a mechanism to go get to do a random number generate and then check and see if it was there, um, which across to the 64 is you know, pretty good. Um, or you can calculate it yourself, maintain it yourself, do that calculation yourself, but at least it was outside of the system that was happening. Um, so for example, our legacy checks um, didn't have a way to reach back to um, the core system. And so um, you know, they, they did that calculation. And we exposed an ability to make that, you know, uh, that, that deterministic calculation in the library. Um, the change we made was to hash those resultant sources over 128 buckets. Pretty simple, really. Um, it's like, okay, well, um, it turns out that just writing to Ceph was fine. It was not the bottleneck. In fact, one of our, our, our sort of workarounds temporarily was just to take everything off the wire and write it to disk, write it to Ceph. And that was glorious. None of the CPUs twitched. Ceph didn't even notice. We were dumping everything off the wire just into a cache bucket, basically, into a temporary bucket. And it was great. The machine that was picking that up and then you know, filing it off according to the original algorithm was burning. But 
um, it sort of really illustrated that we could take stuff at wire speed and, and get into Ceph, and, and Ceph wouldn't even notice. So the data volume wasn't the issue. Um, so we sort of took that idea and, and mutated it a bit and say, well, any, for any object uh, source coming in, figure out which bucket it goes into and, and fire it in. Um, the number of buckets is a, a, fa if a factor in the equation, and the other is um, the size of the time epoch. Um, so the, it was no longer fixed to 100,000 seconds, because one of the problems there is what happens if you've got a high-rate source? Um, it'll end up with you know, a huge bucket, whereas um, you know, low-rate sources uh, would, be, would be very sparse. So the system adapts. So that's why the timestamps here are now in nanoseconds are, are rolling along. In hindsight, or like this was done by, by my colleague Christian, um, we came up with a design on a Friday, and I came in on Monday, he'd already done it on the weekend. So um, I certainly wasn't going to complain. Um, one thing I would change in hindsight is that when you do a Rados, not that you want to be doing Rados LS very much, but if, you were to, if you're doing diagnostics and you do a Rados LS on the, on the pool that has these buckets, these objects in it, this doesn't order very well. <laughs> it orders by bucket, by, by hash slot, not by timestamp. And you really want to see how many, you know, where, you know, see them all together. So that would be one thing I'll change in the V3 ep generation is, is just put it back so that it does list out in order nicely. The other thing we changed was that there are two types of points. There are simple points, which are simply just Word 64 values, and extended ones, which are, are arrays of bytes. So we still have the ability to take in uh, arbitrary length data, because one thing we'd like to store is, is web server logs. Um, having the ability to correlate um, systems data with what's going on in a web server would be very nice. And so we did want the ability to take in arbitrary strings. Um, and so that's, that's what the objects look like in Ceph. So still a deterministic lookup. Like once you can form this object, you go get it, and Ceph gives it back to you, and that's no problem. Um, the, again, not maintaining state. The, the evolution of the number of, of buckets in a given epoch and the, the size of the length of that epoch is, is maintained in, in, a, in two, two Ceph objects, one for simple, one for extended, and it looks kind of like this. Um, and again, just very simple serialization format. And, um, and then the data points themselves, the final change was is that uh, we kind of worked this out exactly the same time that Yaron Minsky, who's the um, head of engineering at uh, Jane Street Capital in New York, came down and gave some lectures in Sydney. And he was talking about, it's not directly relevant here, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a fascinating insight. He's like, if you want fast code, uh, market high frequency trading fast code, you can't allocate. You have to use fixed size buffers. You fill a buffer, you process it, you empty it, and you refill it. Um, no allocation. And that's the way to make fast code. Um, that's not for me, but that's from a guy, <laughs> one of the people that makes the markets work. So um, that was a nice reinforcement of the idea we had, which was it seemed to, to us that the way to get around um, it seems for a long time we avoided creating file formats. We had it drummed into us for a, while, for a while there that we shouldn't create our own file formats. I'm like, well, wait a minute. If you can articulate what the rules for a format are and what the offsets are, you just use it. And so we came up with something very simple. It's uh, three words, uh, and, and we have one for the address, uh, one for the timestamp, fits in very nicely, and then the payload. And that's it. So for every 24 bytes, that's a data point. That's it. Um, that's, uh, you know... Um, could we make that smaller? Sure, but it does mean that we have the ability to, um, and we're not even doing much in the way of pre-allocation tricks, but it does mean that it's, it's, it's fairly compact, and that comes off the wire, and we just take it off the wire and write it to the disk once we figure out where it's going, and that's it. Reading is then finding the bucket that holds that, that source that it's been hashed to, and then we just read the whole bucket in and scan down it, and it's a very fast filter operation and um, find out the, the, the three bytes that have, the three words that have, or if you want to drill it as a column, just run your, run your finger down it, pull out the ones that have your source, and there you go, and then do the deduplication all the times. So that's what goes on for the simple data points. Um, the extended data points, um, we, it comes in much together, but then when it goes out to disk, we write out a, sing, a simple point that includes the offset in what is just a long appending file um, for where the, the, the data is. So we say, okay, it offset 655330 uh, is, there's, then there's a, a length prefix and, uh, and then the data, you know, your web server log point or whatever. And, you know, one of the guys who works, works for us says, hey, can I put, can I put sound data in there? We're like, no, no. <laughs> um, and, hey, um, it's happening. And, um, in fact, you know, I finally designed something that works. Um, I just pulled these numbers up an hour ago. Um, this is the current size of our, uh, of our production vault. Uh, there are uh, not even a million objects yet, and uh, we're running about one and a half terabytes. This represents about 10 months of every data metric that Anchor Systems has collected. 
um, for system metrics, and it also now includes for the last three months all the data we've collected on metering and measuring what OpenStack is up to. So Solometer's data is feeding in here as well. Um, and it's rolling at under 100 operations per second, oscillates. Um, there are some, some factors there that scale O in. Um, but we're running at about 77 operations a second, and um, the machines aren't twitching. Uh, that's 15-minute load average on the writer. Um, and um, I'm pretty pleased about that. Uh, it means it's, it's a viable system. One quick digression, but back to Ceph, um, because I did say this talk was about running Ceph in production. Um, there's two classes of, of load. We're putting all that load is going into the object store, but of course we're running um, our, the, the nodes of the system on, on OpenStack, on RBD, and um, that in turn is running on a different Ceph cluster, the one we just brought up for, for our production cloud. And um, if you've never worked with Ceph, this will be a bit gibberish. Um, if you're an old Ceph hand, you'll recognize this, but this is what Ceph looks like when it's healthy. There's some monitors, there are, it tells you something about how much disk space there is available, and it says that the placement groups, the, the modules that Ceph hashes over before sending it out to its individual machines, um, is all happy and clean. Um, when, a, um, uh, when a single OSD is down, um, you get something that look, might look like this. Uh, it says that, well, I'm missing one, there's only 167 of the 168 are up, and uh, most of them are happy, but uh, the other ones are happy, but they are currently being served by their peers. And then it goes into other phases, like um, it evolves from there to suddenly decides after a period of time that, no, it looks like that machine's not coming back, so I'm going to need to worry about cascading the data on. Um, Seth's very clever in that if, if there's a reboot happening, there's no reason to rebalance the whole cluster for, that, for every given object if the disk is coming back and just the machine is unavailable for a little while. Um, so that's the difference between a machine being down and a machine being out. Uh, and that's just by default is 10 minutes, but you know, you just really kind of, you can configure that. And you can also flag it to not do that if you're doing heavy cluster maintenance. But you see things like this in a, in a fairly ordinary case. Um, it comes up with health worn as the indication, but really that's probably something that we should change a bit because this is entirely nominal behavior. Um, but unfortunately, it's the same thing when it looks like this. And um, I had this on the wall at, at work, and this is, this is like, you know, I showed this to Tim. He's like, can I take a picture of this? Um, yeah, this was real. This happened. Uh, we were having some network trouble. <laughs> and <laughs> um, what was happening was uh, InfiniBand and XFS were fighting each other for the highest order of allocations in the memory manager. Um, it looks like we were one of the first people to hit this one, but since we've heard other people squealing in pain, so at least it's not just us. Um, now we've worked out. Um, some workarounds, and, and, um, but the problem was ultimately that um, a uh, InfiniBand would start dropping packets um, because XFS was trying to store too many extended attributes because, anyway. Um, and so packets were getting lost, and another machine would assume that since it wasn't getting reports of health checks or packets lost, it was like, oh, that machine must be down. And so it would start telling all of its friends that that machine was down, even though it wasn't. And Ceph copes with that, but this was happening en masse. But then it started happening to the monitors, too. And so the monitors would go away, which was triggering a monitor election. So you shouldn't really get a monitor election more than like once a month, and that's just because it's bored. Uh, we were getting a monitor election every couple of minutes. Um, and needless to say, the whole thing came to a screaming halt. Um, I you know, never want to see recovery I.O. looking like that ever again. Um, but um, you know what? I'll tell you something. Every single VM was wedged, like you're sitting there pressing enter on your shells and why is nothing happening? You know, everything was stopped, which from an availability standpoint represents loss. Yeah, we, I mean, we, you know, this thing was down. We were down in terms of any external consumer. But all the VMs were safe. They were just blocked. Ceph is a consistency store, not an availability one, right? Cap theorem, CAP. Um, most systems nowadays are built as AP stores. You have... Uh, lots of copies, you write to it, and you write an update, and eventually one will overwrite the other if its last writer wins, or maybe if you're really smart, you'll build a CRDT. That's a topic for another day. Um, and if you're not really smart, you'll have a shopping cart like Amazon's that just things magically appear and disappear. The, um, but Dynamo, React, Cassandra, um, these are all availability stores. And indeed, S3 is, as a whole is present. I mean, S3 is great if you write to it once. It'll acknowledge that right and done. Just don't update anything in it. Well, and expect to have you know, a consistent answer any time this week, um, which is why you don't want to use S3 for backups. Um, the, or at least to build a file system on anyway. Um, the, I told you at the beginning that Ceph 
Rados, the object store, the entire system of all these peers talking to each other was built to be the mechanism underneath a file system, a distributed file system. And the semantics of every file system we've ever built has been the assumption that the, the file system code owns the blocks. This is why you don't hook one drive up to two different machines. And uh, in order to build, this is the hard part about building a distributed file system is that you've got multiple machines all trying to hit the same blocks, right? So the Ceph abstract, the, the rate of subtraction presents a consistency model. They're using Paxos to guard the master map of what's available, and then the nodes them can, can themselves uh, order, you know, create consistency. Um, Ceph will block if it can't complete a write. Ceph will block if it, can, you know, and it, it, it would just sit there and stop. The whole thing grinds to a halt. Terab hundreds of terabytes, as you saw there, just suddenly unavailable. And that's the point. And you kind of really have to sort of clench your hands hard and go, yes, this is what I wanted. Because we're kind of used to languages that, that, that yes, it compiles and runs, it doesn't work, and you know, we monkey patched it into insensibility, but, but it runs, damn it. Um, you know, and you know, why are we working in, in a statically compiled, strongly typed language? Well, you know, things, things don't compile when, when something downstream is broken and you know, we have a build chase. Well, that's the point. I don't want to be able to build this software if it's broken. And I'd prefer the compiler telling me that than, um, than, find, than our users finding out at runtime. Um, CP versus AP is the same thing. So um, when we were able to figure out the problems that I was alluding to on the previous slide and we hit, you know, execute one of our workarounds, suddenly, a whole bunch of enter, you know, shell prompts go by because no, it's it's happy now. It's it's got its read back, you know, and carries on. So um, the client VMs that were running the system never fell over, and um, and likewise, similar behavior in the object store. We haven't lost. Uh, we have, you know, um, our systems absorbing data have occasionally forgotten to write or fallen over, but once Voltaire has accepted a data point, we haven't lost a single one uh, in, in, in 10 months of running. So um, that's really not down to me so much as it is to Steph being an amazing piece of engineering. And if you can tolerate the consistency property, <laughs> um, it's something you should really consider looking at. Uh, we've been in production for a while. Um, as I said, uh, the second version improved the write performance problem. There is a corner case that we've hit, which of course is a, you've got you know, a bucket with, um, it's very fast for a single read. You, know, you just scan down it and pull that data point out and gather them together and give them back. Uh, the reason I built this monster was to do analytics on, and so the first thing that our data scientists, PhDs did was want, request all the data. <laughs> Which went O and squared on me, needless to say. Um, so a pretty obvious optimization is gather in a bulk re request, figure out what reads are going into a single bucket, and do all those at the same time. That's going to happen now, and then uh, we've got some further work to go. The final thing is, um, am I about to get cut off at the knees here? Really quick. All right, the final thing is caching. Um, I talked about uh, immutability of data being the big insight. The other insight into the system that I want to offer is that um, for us to improve proof performance, um, it's obvious that we can put caching in front of the thing. Uh, the biggest insight we've had is that there are different types of data. That we don't just want an arbitrary cache. There's three kinds of data we care about. Um, first and foremost, I want those bulk reads to not mess up the system. But there are, um, uh, there's a live set of data. There's basically everything that's happened in the last couple hours, eight hours or so. I need that all in memory because I can build models that are evolving over time and looking for patterns and doing alerting and, and calculations. And it turns out it's only going to be like 180 gigabytes. I can keep that in RAM, no problem. The last, last eight hours of data is 180 gigs, uh, even if it's really slow to that. That was with a 10x multiplier for memory layout. Um, and so we can keep that in memory, no problem. So we're going to create a fast path across the top that doesn't go down. So just any point that comes in will get broadcast across the live set cache. And so it makes those points available. The second set of data that we care about is a very, very limited set of, but the, the few data points that we do care about for billing. Right? If a customer wants to look at their bill, they want to look at their, their current complete bill, which is last month, they probably want to compare it to the month before that, fine, and we need to be accumulating the current set so that we can tell people what their usage is in real time. And that's all I need to care, care about. I just need to make sure that those are up. I can't have a slow query being blocked down in the data vault. So that's the second specific type of, of data set that we'll have cached. And, and, and then the third one is um, to take those, the remainder of the traffic as bulk reads, cache it, because sometimes people ask for the same query multiple times. Um, so there's no reason we can't accelerate that. Um, but um, just basically pass that through and keep it out of the way. Um, no, you know, I'm not going to give follow the Linux rule on this one, but um, it's a lot of pieces. Um, if I actually, in hindsight, I probably should have ruthlessly suppressed the number of repositories that this is proliferated out to. It basically matches mostly um, Haskell modules, but also other languages in there. Um, the stuff I've been talking about today is the, the three at the top that are bold-faced. Um, there's a lot of people that have gone into making this what it is. Um, it's I can't say it's an open source project in the sense that it's a large community yet. 
Um, but down on the bottom there, Aaron Zimmerman is the first person outside of Anchor who's called in and said, I'm trying to install it, can you help me out? So we've got, you've got users outside the company, which is terrific. And a big shout out to Katie, whose talk on Machiavelli you might have seen yesterday, um, who's built a visualization system, which is a big consumer of this. Um, and um, the uh, and to people outside the company as well who have, have offered us help on design and the indexes that we'll build on the next generation. So uh, the last thing I, I mentioned is I wanted to build analytics on this, and this is just a very quick uh, example of the, one of the early outputs of, of the system in terms of being able to use the knowledge that we've gathered, and this is uh, correlating uh, what kind of failure modes happen in HTTP servers with met system metrics and a, a decision tree model. So um, that's what I had to say. Thanks for your time. Okay. <laughs> On behalf of LCA, Please take this gift, Andrew. Thanks very much. And please thank Andrew. Yeah. Again. <laughs>